Hello, Hi, everybody. everyone. Uh, oh, go ahead, Courtney. Now you've got this. <laughs> Hi, everyone. We're about two minutes out. Um, two minutes out from starting the presentation. Thank you for joining us. We'll be with you guys at 2 p.m. on the dot. Okay, we've hit our 2 p.m. mark, so hello everyone and welcome to the final uh, webinar of our ITBE Spring Webinar Series. This is our fourth year doing the series, so we thank you all for joining us today and for those that have joined us in our previous editions. For those of you that do not know me, my name is Carlos Rivers and I am the Operations Research Analyst for the Institute for Competency-Based Education at a and Commerce. I have had the pleasure uh, of working numerous times with today's presenter, Dr. Kevin Peake. So we are thankful uh, to him for sharing his wealth of knowledge on CBE with us today. Uh, I don't know if, if you all know this, but AM Commerce and South Texas College uh, developed the first SAC COC approved uh, competency based education program in the, in the state of Texas. So, really, today you're hearing from one of the lead experts in the subject uh, for the state. And so he will be sharing best practices in developing and implementing competency-based education programs in institutions of higher education. If you have any questions for Dr. Peak along the way, please write them in the questions box or in the chat, and we will be sure to get them answered in our Q&A section at the end of, of the webinar. So without further ado, I will pass the ball to Dr. Peak, who will introduce himself and take it on from here. Dr. Peak, welcome. Thank you, Carlos, for that very kind and generous presentation. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. This presentation is based on a handbook that is scheduled to be published in mid-August and is funded by a generous grant from the Texas Higher Education Foundation. It is designed primarily for institutions of higher education that are new to competency-based education. Its central purpose is to provide an introductory step-by-step -step guide to develop and implement quality academic and workforce programs in conformance with best practices and pertinent policies and regulations. The secondary purpose of this handbook is to contribute to the growing body of best practices in competency-based education. While developing and implementing a CB program may seem fairly easy, the reality is often quite different. In many cases, just getting a CB program off the ground can be a tremendously challenging undertaking. Notwithstanding the extensively documented interest, very few programs actually make it past the planning and development stages. Of those, of those that do, the vast majority fall short of their initially projected enrollment, retention, and graduation rates. The most comprehensive and timely study to date on post-secondary CB programs in the United States, the 2018 National Survey of Post-Secondary Competency-Based Education, found that 57% of the colleges and universities in the study that had proposed the creation of a CB program were at the planning stages. 32% had developed one or more courses, and a mere 11% had developed a full CBE program. Our intention in writing this handbook and in sharing it with you is to contribute to the number of IHEs that make it past the planning and development stages to fully implement a quality CBE program. The obstacles to developing and implementing CB programs, both internal and external to IHEs, can be intimidating at times. Opposition from faculty and administrators, insufficient resources, 
divergent interpretations of CBE and its impact, inflexible policies and regulations, student resistance to new educational practices, and simple bureaucratic inertia are only a few of the more obvious ones that come to mind. The position adopted by this handbook and articulated in this presentation and supported by overwhelming empirical evidence, however, is that most of these obstacles can be overcome or at least minimized through sufficient planning and preparation. Opposition from faculty and administrators, for example, is usually a simple matter of insufficient or incorrect information about CBE that can be addressed through periodic and regularly scheduled information and orientation sessions. The order in which topics will be presented in this webinar is as follows. What is competency-based education? What steps do we recommend for developing a CBE program at the post-secondary level? And finally, why is it important to develop and implement quality CBE programs, especially during the current health crisis? Competency-based education operationalized. In addition to standard definitions, one of the best ways to understand competency-based education is through identifying shared characteristics that operationally define it. I think that's a good place for us to get started. In the following slides, we will very briefly identify 10 such characteristics that operationally define competency-based education, and I think help us, particularly institutions that are new to competency-based education, get a better understanding of what it is. Characteristic number one, in CBE courses, time is no longer the determinant of learning. Students are given the opportunity, under the guidance of instructors, facilitators, to access educational materials and complete assessments at their own pace and when they determine that they are ready. If, for example, a student finishes all course requirements prior to the term ending, he or she receives credit for the course and moves on. This practice eliminates the superfluous use of resources accelerate student progress, and lowers costs for both students and IHEs. Characteristic number two, students are no longer required to relearn material that they have already mastered. Most CBE courses begin with a preliminary assessment of subject matter competency for all students, usually referred to as a pretest. The course instructor or facilitator evaluates the results of the assessments and determines which competencies remain for each student to learn. Then, based on the assessment results, individualized educational plans are developed for each student to cover the competencies that they are missing. For example, let's say that student X enrolls in a CBE welding course. He or she was previously employed as an apprentice welder and is already knowledgeable of and able to demonstrate competency of 70% of the course content. The instructor facilitator would not require the student to relearn this material, but rather would focus on the remaining 30% of course content that the student is lacking. Characteristic number three, learning and assessment are individualized. CBE theory is firmly grounded in the premise that students learn in different ways and that to the extent possible, instruction and assessment should be tailored accordingly. Some students prefer visual instruction, while others are auditory learners. Some learn best through logical models and others through abstraction. And still other students thrive in group interaction, while others are more accustomed to work alone. Developing CBE courses that adapt to the rich diversity of student learning styles is not always easy, but it's proven over and over again to promote student success. Characteristic number four, and once again, we're looking at these different characteristics that help us to operationally define, operationally understand, get a better concept of what CBE is. So characteristic number four, assessment is primarily formative in CBE courses. Beginning with primary education, student assessment in the United States is almost always entirely summative. In a typical elementary, junior high, or high school class, students are required to take a predetermined number of exams at regularly scheduled intervals that purportedly measure their overall understanding of the course material covered since the previous exam. The concern with this approach is that summative evaluations are comparatively less amenable to measuring all of the competencies that students should master for a given academic workforce course. For example, let's assume that an introductory English class at College X expects students to learn the following learning outcomes, pre-writing process, 
essay construction, critical analysis, and writing revision skills. A student who passes a summative exam of these learning outcomes with a 70% or better may not have sufficiently mastered all of them or, in a worst case, scenario, worst case scenario, has passed the exam without demonstrating any understanding or one or more of the learning outcomes. On the other hand, in a series of formative exams, preferably in real time, the English instructor facilitator would assess student competency of each of the learning outcomes. This approach is more thorough and rigorous as the majority of CBE programs only award credit after students have passed all course competencies. Characteristic number five, students progress through courses at their own pace. There can be little doubt that students not only learn in different ways, but at different rates. CBE programs, in addition to eliminating the aforementioned expectation that students complete a course in a predetermined period of time, allow them to move through course material at their own pace. Instead of requiring students to complete an exercise, reading assignment, or exam by a, by a specific date and time, CBE courses are configured to allow them, under the guidance of the course instructor facilitator, to decide when they are ready to progress through course content. As professional educators, we know that giving students a little more time to learn a concept, complete an essay, or take an exam can often mean the difference between passing and failing a class, or that sometimes students learn a concept, complete a learning exercise, or are prepared to take an exam more quickly than anticipated. Characteristic six, this individualized teaching and learning inherent to CBE courses enables instructors, instructors facilitators to stimulate advanced students without losing other students who do not progress as quickly. And I think this is one of my favorite. Ask any experienced teacher if he or she has struggled with this conundrum, and you are likely to hear vivid stories of talented students who became bored or disinterested, or less prepared students left behind due to inflexible curriculum and schedules that they simply couldn't keep up with. CBE revol resolves this problem by giving advanced students the opportunity to progress through course content at an accelerated rate with the option of covering more rigorous material while simultaneously allocating additional time to other students that might need it. If nothing else, this is one of the most compelling reasons to consider the adoption of the CBE model. Year after year, traditional programs lose countless students for the simple reason that they are unable or unwilling to adapt their respective learning and assessment models to the different learning styles and paces of an increasingly diverse, diverse student population. Characteristic seven, CBE courses tend to be more rigorous than their traditional counterparts. First, CBE courses require students to master all course competencies before they receive credit. In traditional courses, assessment is usually summative, and a passing grade signifies that a student has mastered at least 70% of course content. Second, the individualized curriculum and instruction in CBE courses means that students generally receive more one-on-one receive more -on -one time with the instructor. Third, the excessive scrutiny attendant to the growing popularity of CBE has created an atmosphere in which many programs are constantly under pressure to demonstrate that they are just as rigorous, if not more, than their traditional counterparts. For example, our colleagues at University X define competency in a course as completing all work with an average grade of 90% or better. In University Y, competency means that each of the assessments in a course has been passed with a minimum grade of 80%. And my favorite, University Z defines competencies as demonstrative proficiency at the level of a trained professional. In response to critics who decry the alleged mediocre standards of CBE, it can be reasonably argued that there are very few traditional programs that require students to earn an average of 90% on all coursework, pass each exam with an 80% or better, or demonstrate that they are just as proficient as experienced professionals to receive credit. We're coming to an end, don't worry. Characteristic eight, CBE programs are usually more dynamic and responsive to ever-changing labor market requirements and better prepare students to compete in the modern globalized workforce. Some of the most well-known complaints expressed by employers in the private and public sector about college and university graduates are that they are re their reading, writing, and mathematics skills are insufficient, they are unable to apply what they learn in the classroom to real life situations, they have neglected their soft skills, particularly group activity and oral communication, 
and they're poorly equipped to adapt to rapidly changing conditions in the workplace. Competency-based education in many ways has evolved as a direct response to these and other concerns and is becoming increasingly popular among employers seeking graduates with credentials that more closely align with modern labor market requirements and who have received experiential training and assessment that better prepare them to professionally apply what they have learned. Characteristic nine, CBE gives students a more realistic idea of what they will be doing in their chosen profession. One of the core premises of CBE is that learning and assessment should not be limited to traditional classrooms or online courses, but when appropriate, occur in an environment and or under circumstances that most closely replicate where a student is likely to be employed. The advantage of this approach, aside from documented improvements in employee performance, is that it not only helps students decide what they want to do with their careers, but perhaps even more important, what they don't want to do. And the tenth and final operational characteristic that I think helps us to better get our minds around what CBE is, is that CBE programs generally contain stringent quality control mechanisms and emphasize ongoing program review and improvement. In order to remain viable and comply with the core mandate to prepare students for constantly evolving labor market requirements, the vast majority of CBE programs at the post-secondary level understand and take very seriously the importance of continuous review and improvement, learning and assessment strategies, course competency content, educational technology, instructor knowledge and pedagogical proficiency, and other essential components of quality CBE programs are integral to student success, and as such, are regularly evaluated and updated. So, what are the 14 steps to develop a CBE program? This content is not intended to be comprehensive, nor does it constitute the only approach to planning, developing, and implementing a CBE program. It is, however, based on best practices that we have observed in our collaboration with other IHEs to create CBE programs over the last 10 years, input from colleagues, and ongoing research. Most importantly, these 14 steps that we've developed emphasize three specific criteria. They're designed for IHEs that are new to CBE, aspire to present information in a conversational, user-friendly manner, and include the most up-to-date information on CBE theory and practices. This table contains the steps that we recommend to develop and implement a CBE program at the post-secondary level. Depending upon your program's current stage of development, resources, time, and other factors, you may want to modify, combine, reorder, and or eliminate some of these steps. Please take a minute to look at table one. It outlines these steps and may be used as a checklist in the process of program development and implementation. So let's take a minute to look at this table. And once again, this is a table that gives us a step-by-step -step outline for developing and implementing competency-based programs at the post-secondary level. When we were researching this table, we canvassed the entire educational ecology of the country, looked into literally hundreds and hundreds of CBE programs for best practices. And what we discovered is that these 14 steps, these 14 steps in this table that we recommend for creating a CBE program are truly the steps that have proven most effective in quality programs all around the country. So let's take a look at these steps. If you're new to CBE and you're thinking about developing a CBE program, welcome. I hope this is of help to you. If you already have a CBE program, I hope that some of this information perhaps could be incorporated into your existing program for the sake of ongoing revision and improvement. So the first step that we recommend if you're developing a CBE program is to define and operationalize the concept of competency-based education. We need to know what we're talking about. Second, assess institutional perceptions of CBE. Third, select a program for conversion to the CBE format. And don't worry if I'm going through this a little quickly, we're gonna go through each one of these steps in detail in a moment. Fourth, form a program development and implementation committee. Fifth, select a CBE learning and assessment model. 
Sixth, identify the resources needed at each stage of program planning, development, and implementation. Seven, select and apply a cost estimation model. Eight, devise strategies to promote program acceptance and institutional inclusion. Nine, schedule CBE faculty orientation and training sessions. 10, develop and approve CBE courses. 11, include relevant institutional actors in the development and implementation of your CBE program. 12, schedule student information orientation sessions. 13, ensure program compliance with pertinent institutional and external rules and regulations. And finally, develop and implement a system of ongoing program evaluation and improvement. So as I mentioned, let's look through each one of these steps in more detail, beginning with the first one. The first and most important step in the development of a CBE program is to define competency-based education, both conceptually and operationally. Definitions that are clear, generally accepted, and easily accessible will strengthen the probability of program success in various ways, beginning with the abatement of negative and counterproductive misunderstandings and stereotypes. As is the case with any academic workforce program in post-secondary institutions, faculty, staff, and administrators who are supportive and work together as a team are indispensable to the success of a new CBE program and that of its students. A clear, cohesive definition of CBE and how it can benefit students goes a long way towards reducing misunderstandings and converting potential adversaries of CBE programs into advocates, and in some cases, champions. The definition of competency-based education is reflected for this handbook can be seen on the screen and was formulated by the Competency-Based Education Network. It's been endorsed by over 600 different schools. After you have a standard definition of competency-based education, the next step, of course, is to operationalize it, which we've already done. The current and the next slide identify the operational components of CBE that we've already covered, and I think help us even better than a standard definition to understand what CBE is. All right, so you're developing a CBE program. First, define what it is that you mean by CBE. Make sure you're all on the same page. You would be surprised how many colleges and universities initiate development programs with different and sometimes contradictory ideas of what CBE is. We recommend this definition. We recommend these operational components. But if you opt for another, that's okay. There's a lot of good ones out there. Just make sure you're all on the same page. Okay, step two. Assess institutional perceptions of CBE. The expansion of CBE across the American ed educational landscape is indisputable to, e to all but the most ardent of critics. Its acceptance as a viable quality alternative to traditional education is evidenced by the proliferation of CBE programs and the growing credibility of their graduates in the labor market. At the same time though, it cannot be disputed that the vast majority of CBE programs fail to make it past the planning stages. There are undeniably many reasons for this, but the most common is simple opposition from faculty, staff, and administrators. If your program is to be successful, it's necessary to assess the perception that your colleagues have of CBE and develop strategies to promote acceptance and when possible, inclusion. In most cases, changing negative attitudes about CBE is a simple matter of information. <coughs> The empirical and logical evidence supporting the efficacy of CBE is overwhelmingly on your side. In fact, you might just be surprised by how many opponents become champions once they realize how much their students can benefit from CBE. There are two surveys that we recommend, and all of this information is contained in the handbook that I'll be sending to all of you. Um, so the two surveys that we recommend that you use in your institution to assess how faculty, staff, and administrators perceive competency-based education are first, the survey of the shared design elements and emerging practices of competency-based education. This was developed by Public Agenda. It was a survey that was conducted literally in hundreds of colleges and universities across the country. This could be used in your institution to give you a, an in-depth understanding of the level of knowledge and how your colleagues perceive competency-based education. If you don't want that much depth in the survey that you use, there are a number of other surveys that have been developed by colleges and universities. One that we recommend was developed by Austin Community College. 
Um, it's a marvelous, multifaceted survey that helps institutions not only to determine how, how CBE is perceived at the institutional level, but also to what extent CBE might be right for a given program. Step three, select a program for conversion to the CBE format. When doing this, our first suggestion is to consult with external sources who are qualified to advise on the cost benefits of converting different academic workforce programs to the CBE format. Creating a CBE program can be a costly undertaking. Before making the decision to invest time, money, and other valuable resources, be sure that the program you select will give you the greatest return on your investment. Second suggestion, investigate current and future labor market trends to better determine which programs justify the resources that will be expended to develop a CBE option. For better or worse, in the final analysis, your program is most likely to be judged on the basis of the employability of its graduates, rather than the intrinsic value of creating better educated citizens. There is no scarcity of outstanding CBE programs that produce highly qualified graduates for professions that are disappearing or simply cannot absorb them. Third suggestion, assess the predominant characteristics of the student in your potential CBE programs. As stated earlier, certain CBE, mo CBE models work better for some students than others. If, after evaluating the results of the assessment, you decide that CBE is still the best option, you will be better equipped to tailor your CBE model to the specific needs of your students. Fourth suggestion for selecting the right program for conversion to the CBE format, consult with faculty, staff, and mid-level administrators who are most familiar with the programs offered by your IHE. There is an unfortunate tendency in higher education, and it appears to be on the rise, to marginalize some of the very people who are most knowledgeable about academic workforce programs. Ongoing conversations with all knowledgeable institutional representatives will give you a much broader and deeper understanding of the suitability of a given program for conversion to CBE and its likelihood of success. As mentioned above, these suggestions are not intended to be comprehensive. They are, however, based on best practices and will help you get started in the selection of a program for the conversion to the CBE format that is right for you and your students. Step four in the development of your CBE program, form a program development committee. After you have selected a program for conversion to CBE, the next step is the formation of a program development committee. The PDC will directly oversee all aspects of program planning, development, and implementation. A PDC that achieves targeted results while minimizing opposition and maximizing support is indispensable to the success of your program. The PDC usually includes a minimum of five components, the program chair, assistant chair, or duly appointed substitute. Faculty representatives who instruct courses in the proposed program are familiar with and ideally have experience in CBE and are willing to mentor other faculty. A representative from the distance education department or equivalent, especially if the CBE courses will be delivered online. Representatives from the private public sector who are familiar with labor market conditions and at least two experts in CBE. The characteristics of PDCs that we have found to be most conducive to successful program development and implementation are knowledge, experience, enthusiasm, and an open mind to new and innovative educational alternatives. Step five, select a CBE learning and assessment model. In its most basic form, the term learning and assessment model refers to how and where learning and assessment take place. As more and more schools at all educational levels become actively involved in the development and implementation of CBE programs, there's increased awareness that not all CBE learning and assessment models are the same, and not every model is right for every student. Yes, most CBE learning and assessment models contain shared elements, as described in the operational definition of CBE presented earlier. But there are also variations that exist from one CBE model to another that can make a big difference when deliberating upon which one is right for a particular program and its students. Some students, for example, require a comparatively high degree of teacher-student interaction, while others offer a more independent learning and assessment experience. Variations in CBE learning and assessment models are generally beneficial and stem from differences in institutional policies, regulations imposed by stakeholders, 
program, program content and design preferences, and the specific needs of the student population in question. The rich diversity of learning assessment models, when grounded in standard conceptual and procedural parameters of CBE, offers IHEs the flexibility to select a model that is the most appropriate and effective for them and their students. When deliberating upon which CBE learning and assessment model is right for your program, there are a number of preliminary steps that we recommend to help you make the right decision. Most importantly, consider the specific needs and attributes of your student population. Review pertinent policies and regulations governing program development, implementation, and administration that apply to your IHE. Investigate existing CBE learning and assessment models at IHEs throughout the state and country. And most importantly, consult. Consult with other institutions that have successfully developed and administered one or more CBE programs. It's been our experience that IHEs and other organizations with practical experience in developing and administering CV programs are more than happy to share their knowledge and insights. The next two slides offer a table with information on the different CBE learning and assessment models and their respective pros and cons. I think it's worthwhile to look at this if you have an opportunity. For example, there are in-person course-based models there are online course-based models. There are hybrid CBE traditional course models. There are models that include learning and assessment in the real world, and there are models that include learning and assessment and simulations. All of these models are a little bit different. When you're developing your CBE program, you wanna be sure that you select a model that's most appropriate, and that's going to have the greatest possibility of leading to the success of you, your institutions, and your community. Step six. Identify the source of the resources that you will need for your program. And I know all of this seems like common sense, and perhaps it is, but you would be surprised how many extremely promising competency-based education programs get started only to leave out a key step, a key variable. And that's why, as we're going through these different steps that we recommend to develop and implement a CBE program, sure, some of it might seem obvious or repetitive, but it all needs to be there because our goal is for every single CBE program that has the promise of success to reach that finish line. So step six, identify resources. Identify all the resources that you're gonna need. And these are just examples. You're gonna need a CBE advisory board. You're gonna need CBE course design and development teams, faculty, staff, and administrators, physical capital, technology, et cetera. And all of this information is contained in the handbook. So once again, um, my hope is that all of you are interested in receiving a handbook and that we can send it to you as quickly as possible. But let's move on. Step seven, select and apply a CBE cost estimation model. It is the position of this handbook that while most nationally recognized cost estimation models are well designed and have a proven record of success, the one created by the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems is generally considered to be the most comprehensive, precise, and user-friendly for IHEs developing a CBE program for the first time. With really very few exceptions, the programs for which we have recommended this model have been impressed with the results. Some of the more common representative responses that we have received from colleagues at other IHEs are that this model is easy to input, manipulate, interpret cost data, generates a comparatively small margin of error, and is more comprehensive than other models. So once again, as you are developing the viable or analyzing the viability of your program, make sure to select a cost estimation model that'll give you the best idea of how much this is gonna cost. As I mentioned, this the National Center for Higher Education and Cost Estimation model, we, we recommend. We've seen that it gets excellent results and we truly think it's one of the best. Um, on the next two slides, we can actually see examples of the kind of information that you would input into this model to be able to calculate the cost of your program in the short and long term. Um, this slide is extracted from the model with the permission from the National Center for Higher Education Management. This particular table has a number of smaller tables that feed data into it. It's a table that enables you to calculate the tuition and revenue associated with your program. So you want to develop a program, but you need to know the costs and you need to know your revenues. This model helps you to do that. The second table helps you to identify all of your costs and pretty much quantify them. So 
Um, looks like it's 2.33, so I'm going to move a little bit more quickly. But just to reiterate, I'm, I'm putting a little bit more emphasis on this slide because I think it's critical. All of this is important, but this is truly critical, that as you are conceptualizing, as you're beginning to plan and develop your program, you have an idea of how much it's gonna cost, you know, what your revenues are, what your costs are gonna be. In the final analysis, that'll be one of the big determinants of its viability. Step eight, devise strategies to promote program acceptance and institutional inclusion. And this goes back to what we were saying earlier about assessing institutional perceptions. The importance of securing the acceptance of faculty, staff, and administrators, and even better, their possible inclusion in your CVE program cannot be underestimated. Faculty design and teach courses. They're the subject matter experts and intermediaries between students and the institution. Staff are the glue that hold the organization together. They're responsible for the countless day-to-day -day operations that are essential for programs to succeed. And administrators ultimately decide which programs will survive and which ones won't. All three components are indispensable to the success of your program. Ignoring or marginalizing any one of them can mean the difference between a program that offers new and exciting opportunities to your institution and the student it serves, and one that is eventually left in the dustbin of failed educational experiments. Okay. Step nine, in the process of developing and implementing a CBE program, schedule CBE faculty orientation and training sessions. And I can't tell you how often this is overlooked to the detriment of programs. The content, duration, and frequency of the faculty orientation and training sessions will depend on a number of variables, including time, resources, the complexity of your CBE courses, and existing levels of faculty knowledge and acceptance of CBE. Notwithstanding these variables, there are two components that are normally recommended for inclusion in the CBE faculty training and orientation sessions to maximize their effectiveness. The first is to clearly explain the general theory and practice of CBE. One of the most recurrent and usually justified complaints that we hear from instructional faculty in CBE programs is that they have received diverse and often contradictory explanations of the theory and practice of competency-based education. Orientation and training sessions are a golden opportunity to establish standard guidelines for what CBE is and how it works. Dispel some of the misconceptions that typically circulate around college campuses and promote a greater degree of faculty acceptance and inclusion. The second component that faculty facilitator training and orientation sessions should, should include, as described by Tanya Roskler, Managing Director for the Center for Digital Education, <clears throat> is to establish and communicate common faculty competencies for developing and instructing CBE courses. In other words, you want to clearly explain to instructional faculty what they should know and be able to do in order to successfully develop and instruct CBE courses. Examples of basic instructor competencies contained in most CBE faculty and orientation training sessions include, but are not limited to, understanding of CBE theory and practice, understanding of and demonstrated ability to create CBE competencies, demonstrated ability to individualize educational materials within a CBE course, demonstrated ability to design assessments in accordance with CBE best practices, and demonstrated ability to develop and apply grading rubrics based on CBE best practices. This table contains sample performance indicators to measure the knowledge and skills of CBE instructional faculty facilitators. This is also contained in the handbook and could be useful in the process of, of training your instructors and informing them about CompC-based education. Step 10, develop and approve CBE courses, a lot. This is the lion's share of what, we're, what we do with our programs. The majority of people who participate in the development of CBE courses for the first time find that it's not as difficult as it originally appeared. For example, the skills that professional educators acquire through years of study and classroom experience are the same ones they need to contribute to the development of CBE courses and include the ability to select and or create quality individualized educational materials, articulate competencies that are tied to predetermined skills, knowledge that students need to compete in the labor market, create and administer assessments and provide ongoing student guidance. Unfortunately, and this is an unfortunate fact, unfortunately, the tendency to make CBE more difficult than it has to be to convert it into some kind of arcane science 
too often gets in the way of developing quality CBE courses. In reality, nothing could be further from the truth. Developing a CBE course is simply taking the skills and knowledge normally required to develop traditional courses and applying them under different premises and in a modified format. When developing CBE courses for the first time, there are a number of approaches that can be taken, almost all of which include some or all the same basic steps and content. The approach that we recommend includes the following components. Develop course competencies and learning outcome objectives that map back to program learning outcomes and closely correspond to the knowledge and skills that students need to be competitive in the labor market. Select assessment methods based on CBE best practices, the nature of the program being developed, and the characteristics of its students. Assemble diverse educational materials that can be adapted to the individual learning styles and preferences of the students. Elaborate processes and channels for, for providing student feedback at a more accelerated rate than is normally the case in traditional courses, and devise a system for ongoing course and program evaluation and improvement. Here we have a checklist that could be used in the process of developing courses. Take a minute and look through that. If you have any questions about it, we're going to hit the question and answer session here in five minutes and be more than happy to address any of those questions. This is a checklist for evaluating your progress through the development of the CBE courses and stretches on to the next slide. Step 11, include relevant institutional actors in the development and implementation of your CBE program. Comcy-based education is by definition a kind of disruptive innovation. Your CBE program is going to require the same institutional services and products as other programs and even more. And so you want to make sure that other institutional actors, and other departments, divisions, etc., are aware of your CBE program and some of the expectations of them that you might have and some of the resources that you might need. So this is a priority. Include relevant institutional actors outside of your department, outside of your division, that will in one way or another be affected by or that will affect your CBE program. Step 12, schedule student information and orientation sessions. A good idea is to schedule this about a week and a half, two weeks after the general orientation session for new students so they don't become confused, but also it gives them an opportunity to determine whether or not CBE is right for them and to make any adjustments to their schedules that might be appropriate. Step 13, ensure program compliance with pertinent institutional external rules and regulations. If for no other reason, I would recommend that you obtain a copy of this handbook for this reason, to ensure that your program is in compliance with pertinent institutional and external rules and regulations. There's a number of stepping stones out there, both within and external to IHEs, that can be a problem at the beginning as well as once you've implemented your program. I can't tell you how many good programs that we've seen that have gotten started, they've gone through all their planning, all their ducks were in order, they were implemented, a lot of promise for students, only to discover that there was something, there was something in those programs that unfortunately was in violation of some rule or regulation. So make sure, make sure to research all applicable rules and regulations when you're developing and implementing your program. These are the ones that you can probably imagine that have been most problematic. Compliance with credit hour requirements. Now, this one can be a Herculean obstacle. As we know, most IHEs in one way or another base policies on credit hour requirements. How many times, how many hours was a student in that seat? But this is operationally and conceptually incompatible with a lot of COMC-based education. Now, COMC-based education operates off the premise <coughs> that students are able to move at their own rate. What do we do when that rate is incompatible with the credit hour requirements? Title IV funding for course-based CD programs in higher education, regular and substantive interaction, title funding for direct title for funding for direct assessment, and many others. So I advise taking a look through the handbook, particularly this chapter, but if you don't, make sure that you do do the necessary research. We've done it for you already, but make sure that you look into this. Make sure you look into the rules and regulations and how they apply to your program before going too far. Nobody wants to invest time, energy, resources, and emotion 
and creating a good quality CVE program only to hear that for whatever reason, well, maybe there wasn't enough regular and substantive interaction. Maybe you're not complying with the credit hour requirements. Maybe you didn't take into consideration that Title IV funding is okay with CVE as long as there's some kind of educational content. So, so look into that, my friends. Sub 14 and the final step, schedule regular program evaluation and improvement. Um, as we are at a quarter to three, I will leave it there. But I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to this presentation. I want to thank Carlos, James, and Courtney. They are a fabulous team, and they have gone a long way to advance COMC-based education, not only in our state, but throughout the country. Um, so if you have any questions, please pass them along to my colleagues, and I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you, Dr. Peek, uh, for that wonderful presentation. Thank you for uh, sharing uh, your knowledge uh, with our CBE community. Uh, so I will get started with questions. I am having a bit of internet uh, connection issues. So Courtney, if I don't see a couple of these questions, can you read them out, okay? So uh, okay. I have here a first question from Stephanie. What is the process for a college to get a CBE program approved by the Department of Education? Oh, Department of Education. My goodness. Stephanie, please send your email because a lot of a lot of this is going to depend upon how that filters through state interpretation. Fortunately, the Department of Education itself, the Department of Education itself, has been softening its standards. And to give you an give you an example of this, about seven years ago, the Department of Education, under pressure from a number of different entities, initiated an investigation of. Um, Oh, Carlos, what's the name of the institution? Western Governors University. And the argument was that Western, there you go, Western Governors University. And the argument was that Western Government, Governors University was not in compliance with regular and substantive interaction, uh, interaction requirements. Um, shortly after that investigation was launched, it was determined that in fact this institution was culpable and they were fined a significant amount of money that went up into the millions. Um, the Trump administration comes into office, for better or worse, we're not a political program, so we say for better or for worse, whatever your position is. But one result of the Trump administration coming into office is that DOE requirements for competency-based programs have been softened, although they are still somewhat ambiguous, they have been softened. Western Governors University was subsequently exonerated and it was determined that they weren't in violation of regular and substantive interaction. So things have softened, but what DOE is going to be looking at, when you're developing your program, what DOE is gonna be looking at, and this is also gonna be looked at with your local accrediting agencies, and if you're here in Texas with us, that's gonna be SACS. They're going to want to make sure that you are justifying your regular substantive interaction, and they're really going to make want to make sure that you're in compliance with credit hour requirements. So when you're developing your program, write out a clear and detailed justification of how your program maps back to credit hour and how it's in compliance with credit hour requirements. If you need any assistance in doing that, do not hesitate to contact me. Um, Carlos, I'm sure you can make my, well, my, my email is available in the handbook. It's also available through um, Carlos and through Courtney, but it's gonna be compliance with credit hour. It's gonna be um, the, regular, the regular and substantive interaction. It's gonna be some other details that might be specific to your program. But definitely reach out to us. We're more than happy to help on that. Thank you, sir. Uh, from Herb, I noticed you focused on teaching to learning styles, which has been largely been discredited. Will this be updated or better addressed? When we focused in on, when we selected our topic as competency-based education, we canvassed the entire, entire edu educational landscape. We went from one institution to another and to another. And so our analysis is limited specifically to competency-based education. We're not looking at traditional modalities. And I know that within traditional modalities, there is some controversy as to the extent to which individualized teaching and assessment is efficacious. And I'll leave that debate uh, in the margins. But with regards to competency-based education, what we have discovered in reviewing program after program after program is that students benefit from identifying their particular learning styles and preferences. And we've seen it over and over and over again. Um, once again, that 
not always the case in traditional education, and I agree with that. But within competency-based based education, we have found that that's the case. Excellent, thank you, sir. From Barron, a uh, very good question from Barron. Would you advise that all CBE programs have an industry advisory board committee uh, mandated to meet at certain intervals? Um, this would also help with Perkin grants funding also, he believes. So can you talk a little bit about advisory boards? Well, first, I'd like to take that question and incorporate it into my handbook if he'll give me the intellectual rights to it. <laughs> Excellent question. And by all means, by all means, the underlying purpose of competency-based education, I mean, if we go back to the roots of how we define competency-based education today, one of the underlying purposes is for our students to be more competitive in the job market. Now, as a professional educator for the last 27 years, um, maybe my, my, my core objective has always been just to have better citizens, to have better educated people. But the core value of competency-based education, one of those core values has been how competitive will our, our product be? How competitive will our, will our students be in the job market? So by all means, it's indispensable to have industry leaders, leaders from the public and private sector on your advisory boards. It's recommended that they are meeting at periodically mandated time periods. And it's also recommended that you have le um, industry leaders, not only in your advisory boards, but and I, as I mentioned this early, earlier, but also, if this is something that is feasible for your CBE program, invite representatives from the public and the private sector to also sit on your program development committees. Because as you're developing those programs, particularly as you're developing your competencies, you want to make sure that those competencies link to the kinds of skill and knowledge that your students are going to need when they get out there in the real world and they've got to be competitive. So yes, make sure that you consult with external entities, public and private sector, and go a step farther. If you can, bring them into your program development committees and, if possible, try to include them in your competency development committees. Perfect. I have several questions from you if, um, if the, the slides and the presentation are going to be available. Uh, yes, uh, the presentation is recorded and it will go to your email after the conclusion of the presentation. So yes, uh, everything will be shared and we will share uh, Dr. Pete's contact information in, in case uh, you want to ask him additional questions. So next um, question, Carlos, you mentioned... Carlos, has, Carlos yes, has an extension to that. You might have to make a quick comment before we go to the next question. Please, go ahead. Um, this project was funded by a grant from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Committee. Um, technically the Higher Education Foundation. The underlying mandate in writing this handbook was to disseminate best practices on the development and implementation of quality competency-based education programs throughout the entire state. Um, they have also given me permission to disseminate this handbook throughout the country. So in addition to the slides being available, <clears throat> I would once again, and I know I, I sound like a broken record, it's just my tendency as a professional educator, but I would invite once again, our entire audience, everybody who has joined us today for this exploration of competency-based education, to, to leave your contact information with Carlos or to send it to me if you're interested in acquiring a copy of this handbook. Um, yes, there's a little bit of, uh, of self-interest here because I did receive this grant and the mandate is to disseminate it far and wide. So yes, I'm trying to get this out there. But on top of that, um, it's a handbook that has been vetted by a number of different institutions. It's gone through all the different quality control mechanisms. It contains a step-by-step -step process for developing quality competency-based programs based on best practices throughout the entire nation. So please get in touch with us, request a copy of this. It'll be in your best, in best interest, but it will also help you perhaps to to advise colleagues in your institution or other institutions that might be interested in developing their own programs. Excellent. So next Everybody question, does. Dr. Peek. No, go ahead. Uh, you, you mentioned a lot of institutions fail when they try to adopt CBE. Can you speak to specific examples and the reason as, as to why they fail? Good question. Oh, and, and this is the tragic, this is the tragic part. Uh, I, I often get in a little bit of trouble when I'm asked this question, because the answer is not that pretty. There are many reasons why CBE programs fail, but they're almost never logistical reasons. They're almost never reasons of resources and funding. 
they're almost always a misunderstanding of what competency-based education is amongst those individuals who are developing the program and also amongst those who have become adversaries of the program. Uh, let me give you one example. Um, this was about two and a half years ago. I was dining with one of my colleagues in Dallas. Brilliant, very capable administrator. And we were discussing why it is, why it was now, that her program, her CBE program, <clears throat> was so successful, notwithstanding all of the obstacles that we had anticipated at the inception point. And yet other programs that looked like they would have encountered fewer obstacles weren't. Her simple response, her one word response was president. The president of the institution was on board with CBE. Essentially what this is telling us, and once again, I've seen it over and over again, is that one of the biggest obstacles to a CBE program becoming successful is when you have internal opposition. If that's from administrators and you can't win them over, it's gonna be difficult. If it's from instructors and staff members and you can't win them over, it's gonna be difficult. This is why there are two components of the development process that have to do first with institutional perceptions of CBE and second with how to acquire more, more, uh, more support for your CBE program. So make sure you have administrators on board. Second, make sure you have instructors and staff on board. And let me give you another example. And this is an example which, once again, is, is a little bit frustrating and tragic. Um, we worked with one institution a couple of years back. They were developing a comp based program. In the beginning, everything looked fantastic. Everybody was on board. Faculty, staff, administrators, they were all on board in the development of this comp based program. They launched it. They got it underway. About six months into the program, after it had been launched, um, we were discovering that there were a couple of courses where the students... Uh, the attrition rate was fairly high or they weren't successful as their counterparts in the traditional version of those classes subsequent investigation determined that the two individuals and this sounds like something straight out of a, a mystery novel but subsequent investigation determined that two of this course uh, developers although they were two of the most vociferous supporters of cbe in the beginning had intentionally developed those classes to be difficult so that students could fail and they could subsequently justify the notion that cbe wasn't right for their college wasn't right for their students etc so th there's a lot of barriers that get in the way there's a lot of obstacles that get in the way but if your faculty your staff your administrators are on board all of those obstacles you can get past them that's the biggest point get everybody on board Thank you, Dr. Peek. Uh, and uh, just to read off uh, Jessica Masons from our partners of the American Institute for Research, uh, the answer on the senior leadership that you mentioned is also consistent with that of the National uh, Survey for Post-Secondary Education, uh, CBE, that senior leadership support is a critical support or, or, is, or lack thereof is a barrier. So thank you, Jessica, for sharing that with us. Uh, let's see, oh, we're running so out of time, but we can get a couple more in. So how, Dr. Pete, how are institutions developing competency profiles? Are they using specific methodologies to develop CBE courses? Great question. It, it varies from institution to institution. Um, there are best practices in developing the courses themselves. Let me make sure I'm on the, on the right track with that. Could you, could you reiterate the last part of that question, Carlos? I don't want to digress unnecessarily. No worries. Uh, are they using specific methodologies to develop CBE courses? Okay, so once again, varies from institution to institution. What, what we recommend is that you have those specific components in place that we had articulated earlier, the course competencies, the individualized learning and assessment, make sure that you've analyzed the content itself, but I'm short on time, so let me just make the most important recommendation. When you're developing the courses themselves, the most important component are the competencies. When you develop those competencies, the methodology varies from institution to institution, but we are seeing that the majority of institutions are starting to coalesce around some specific best practices. The competencies, you wanna make sure that they map back to the PLOs at your institution, the program learning outcomes. Um, if you're dealing with programs that are gen ed, et cetera, they'll already exist and that won't be a problem. If they're new classes, you're gonna to have to develop PLOs first. Second, with the competencies, make sure that they're aligned with what the public and private sector employers are looking for. Number of ways that you can do that, some of which are, are to be expected by consulting employers, by com 
consulting organizations external to your institution. Others, not so much so. Consulting graduates, consulting um, students who have been out there in the field. Third, with regards to the competencies, make sure that they're progressive. In most instances, you want them to move progressively from relatively easy to more difficult levels of, of, of information processing, demonstration, application, etc. Uh, it looks like I have two minutes remaining. I wish I could go on about this, but what, what I would ask, because this is an interesting topic and it, it merits much more elaboration, um, if the person who asked that question, if you're still here, if you could please send Carlos your email and I'll send you a much more detailed explanation. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Peek. Okay, we're running short on time, two minutes out. So again, Dr. Peek, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, to our attendees, thank you for joining us. Uh, we really hope you found this information valuable and useful to your work. Uh, please remember, and Dr. Peek uh, said this, we are a sharing community, so don't uh, hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, at the Institute or uh, directly to Dr. Peek with additional questions. Uh, we will make sure to make his email available to anyone that's interested. Okay, thank you everyone for your time. Uh, stay uh, healthy uh, and take care. And uh, I'll stick around in case we see any additional questions come in, but, but thank you everyone.